On November 12, 2004, after a six-month jury trial, Scott Peterson was convicted of the homicide of his pregnant wife, Lacey, and their unborn son, Connor. We find the defendant, Scott Lee Peterson, guilty of the crime of murder of Lacey Denise Peterson. But what if I told you that regardless of what you may believe about his case, that you have not heard the whole story? A story that involves a well-funded effort to hide the truth and ultimately to deny justice to the real victims of this case. And I am confident that how this story ends will change the way that you see the Scott Peterson case for good. When I originally started to write this script, my intention was to create a single hour long episode. But after several hundred hours of research, I stumbled onto something that was entirely unexpected. What started off as a single thread that seemed out of place began to unravel and what I found is one of the most egregious efforts to deny justice that I have seen in recent history. And it is something that I believe to be one of the most important issues we face in our time as it relates to the criminal justice system and the way those cases are portrayed in the media. But in order to tell this story, we have to start at the very beginning and I promise you, by the time I'm done, you'll understand why I had to tell this story this way. The initial disappearance of Lacey Peterson grabbed the attention of millions around the world when national news outlets picked up the story of the nearly eight-month-old pregnant wife of Scott Peterson who had gone missing on Christmas Eve under very mysterious circumstances. KTVU Channel 2 reporter Ted Rollins joins us now live from Modesto with the story. Ted? They're looking for 26-year-old Lacey Patterson of Modesto. She is eight months pregnant. We appreciate very much your attention to this incident. Lacey was last seen by her husband, Scott, when she was walking her dog possibly in the area of East La Loma Park, Dry Creek. During the day before Christmas, her husband was fishing in the Bay Area. To many of us who carefully followed the case, all of the available evidence presented on the nightly news seemed to clearly establish that Scott Peterson's guilt was a foregone conclusion. So when I began to watch the case unfold, it came as no surprise to me when he was eventually put on trial and convicted. But over the last several years, an outspoken group of his supporters has seemingly begun to change the narrative of his case, a case that many believed had been long since adjudicated. Supporters of Scott Peterson have continued to grow in number year after year, and in just the last few months alone, his team has gained the support of well-known and respected members of the true crime community. And as a result of their influence, they have given credibility to his cause in the eyes of the general public. We have the evidence to show that Scott Peterson is innocent. He should not be sitting on death row with this many unanswered questions. Within my first few days of researching this case, I began to notice the sheer volume of people who had begun to show support for Scott Peterson's innocence all over the internet. And their numbers have grown in size and scope year after year. From websites to forums, subreddits and documentaries, their presence is undeniable. And now they are harnessing the power of the media to tell their narrative to the world. But I wanted to know if there was any validity to their claims, as well as to better understand the history of their movement. And what I found is why this video is the longest I have ever created. In my investigation, I learned that support for Scott Peterson began in the early 2000s, beginning primarily on scattered message boards all across the internet. But the wave of recent support gained serious traction in 2017 when A&E released a six-part documentary series that brought their narrative to millions of curious spectators. The A&E series seemed to make the case that there was reason to allow people who previously believed in Scott's guilt to now have cause to believe in his innocence. So I made the choice to find out for myself if the claims of his innocence were in fact true. So before I watched the a &E series, I made the decision to leave my preconceived notions at the door and allow myself to ask the question, what if Scott Peterson was actually innocent? His supporters contend that the media frenzy against him was an unfair and malicious denigration of an innocent man overcome by a 24-hour news cycle that had already judged him guilty. 
They explained that all of the evidence against him was entirely circumstantial, that the prosecution had failed to prove their case, and that no forensic evidence ever existed in his case. Do you believe that Lacey was alive on the morning of December 24th? There were over 14 witnesses who reported seeing Lacey and or McKenzie walking in the neighborhood. They also contend that the trial was contaminated by the media who had incorrectly bought into a false narrative about a man who was framed for a crime that he did not commit. But if that were true and Scott Peterson was serving a sentence for a crime that he didn't actually do, then that would mean that his conviction was a devastating travesty of justice and that he had been unfairly judged by the justice system. So I decided to clear the slate, forget everything I thought I knew about this case, and go back to the beginning, reevaluating the evidence and allowing the facts to dictate where I would land on his case. So with the BCM research team in tow, we reviewed trial transcripts, read through countless pages of available evidence, reviewed every available document we could find, and after hundreds of hours of painstaking notes, analysis, and review, I was completely taken aback by what I found in those pages. The evidence and records would eventually cause me to arrive at an entirely new opinion of the Scott Peterson case, based entirely and completely on the facts absent of media narratives and pundit opinions. So today, I want to invite you to join me on this arduous trek, because what I'm about to show you, even if at times it may be things you already know, there are parts to this story that I do not believe have been told. And when I finally saw them, it completely altered the way that I see true crime cases forever. Today, we will review the case of Scott Peterson, carefully analyzing the claims of his innocence, as well as outlining the prosecution's case against him, all while contrasting those details against the court record. And once that is complete, I will share with you what I believe is an urgent issue that we face in our time that directly stems from and impacts the family and memory of Lacey and Connor Peterson. And I believe that by the time this video is over, a compelling case will be made concerning the guilt or innocence of Scott Peterson. This is a tale of two stories, The Scott Peterson Case, Episode 1. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Scott and Lacey Peterson met at a local restaurant where Scott worked as a waiter in San Luis Obispo, California. They would eventually get married in 1997 and three years later purchased a home in the suburbs of Modesto, California. Despite Scott's reticence to have a baby, he would eventually give in and after many months of trying, Lacey would eventually become pregnant in the early summer of 2002 with a due date in early February 2003. On December 23, 2002, Lacey and Scott went to a salon where Scott would get a haircut from Lacey's sister, Amy Rocha. While Scott was getting a haircut, Lacey's sister mentioned that she needed to go pick up a gift basket the following day at 3 p.m. Scott Peterson quickly interjected, offering to pick up the basket for her, mentioning that he would be golfing in the area the following day. Later that same evening, Lacey had a conversation with her mother, Sharon Rocha, confirming that she and Scott would join them the next evening for Christmas Eve dinner. The following day on Christmas Eve, Scott Peterson left the Peterson home to go fishing just after 10 a.m. At 10.18 a.m., a neighbor, Karen Service, notices the Peterson's dog, Mackenzie, wandering around the street aimlessly, still wearing a leash that he would typically wear during walks. Karen would notice that Scott's truck was gone, but Lacey's vehicle was still in the driveway. Karen would go on to place the Peterson's dog into their backyard, closing the gate before she left. After leaving his house, Scott Peterson would then go to his workplace, where he would work for a short time, and then eventually began his trip to the Berkeley Marina, where he went fishing on his new boat. 
After about 90 minutes of fishing, he left the marina, and at 2.15 p.m., he called and left Lacey a voicemail. Hey, beautiful. I just left a message at home. Uh, 2.15, I live in Berkeley. I won't be able to get to the Villa Farms to get that basket for Papa. I was hoping you would get this message and uh, go on out there. I'll see you in a bit, sweetie. Love you. Bye. End of message. Scott would eventually arrive home between 4.30 and 4.45 p.m., when he got home, he noticed that his dog Mackenzie was on his leash and in the backyard. He would walk into his house through the back doors that he noticed was unlocked. Once inside his house, he placed his outfit that he had worn fishing that day in the washing machine, went to the kitchen and ate a slice of pizza with milk, and took a shower. He would later state that he noticed Lacey's vehicle was still at the house but that he assumed she was at her mother's for their previously agreed upon Christmas Eve dinner. At 5.17 p.m., Scott called Sharon Rocha, the mother of Lacey Peterson, to inquire if she was there. He explained to his mother-in-law that Lacey's car was still in the driveway and that when he had arrived home, their dog Mackenzie was on his leash. Scott said that Lacey was missing and after that moment, nothing would ever be the same again. We'd like to thank all of you for being here and helping us trying to find our daughter. And we'd just like to send a message out there that whoever has her, please, please, please let her go. Bring her back. We to love us. her so much. A short time later, Scott began to try and locate Lacey unsuccessfully. Scott would again call Lacey's mother and confirm that he had been unable to find her. A short time later, Ron Gransky, the stepfather of Lacey Peterson, would call the Modesto Police Department to report Lacey missing. From that point forward, the disappearance of Lacey Peterson would take on a life of its own, and in a matter of days, the national media would take interest in the missing pregnant wife of Scott Peterson, which would dominate the airwaves for many years to come. By the following month, it was revealed that Scott Peterson had been having a torrid affair with a 26-year-old massage therapist, Amber Frey. The revelation of the affair seemed to be an insinuation of his culpability by the media, as well as the various pundits who constantly railed against Peterson during this time. It would have been nearly impossible to have been alive in 2003 and not have known about the Lacey and Scott Peterson case, the 24-hour news cycle made certain of that. But it was the eventual discovery of Lacey and Connor Peterson's remains found washed up on the shore of the Berkeley Marina that seemed to send this case to the international stage. Within a week of their bodies being found, Scott Peterson would be arrested for their homicide, and the case against him would remain at the forefront of the minds of the American people until well after his eventual prosecution and conviction. So I wanted to know, what were the new or compelling details supporters of Scott Peterson believed exonerated him of this crime? In part two, we will review the defense of Scott Peterson, as well as the main arguments in support of his innocence. And immediately following that, we will review each argument and contrast it against the court record, filed briefs and pleadings, as well as any other evidence that was presented during and now after his trial. And as always, I will share with you my views of those facts. Let's begin. In defense of Scott Peterson. One of the first encounters that the general public had concerning the defense of Scott Peterson was the aforementioned A&E documentary series. The six-part series was mostly comprised of the Scott Peterson defense team, his family, and his other outspoken supporters, with a small grouping of pundits still in favor of his guilt. The family of Lacey Peterson did not participate in the series. Episode 1 of the documentary begins by recounting the story of Scott and Lacey Peterson, and from the onset, it clearly sets out to establish the innocence of the accused former death row inmate. If you know this case from watching television, probably almost everything you believe to be true about the case is not. Since 2017, virtually every major network that covers true crime content has released their own variations of the series, which often includes the family of Scott Peterson and his many defenders. But because the A&E series represents some of the most detailed accounting of the Peterson defense, 
it will serve as the backdrop for the details that we will review in our analysis. From the very first episode, it is presented to us that Scott Peterson was prosecuted, tried, and found guilty in the court of public opinion by the media long before he was ever arrested for the crime. Right away, we are shown the throng of onlookers watching and waiting for the word of the jury's verdict, then explosively reacting to the news that he had been found guilty. We then begin to hear from the members of Scott Peterson's family and his passionate defenders who tell us that everything we think we know about this case is wrong. And over the course of the entire series, we are given a detailed breakdown of the various arguments that they believe exonerate Scott Peterson. But these are their primary arguments that they present in the series in support of his innocence. The reason the police weren't able to find any evidence of a murder inside this house is because no murder occurred inside this house. The important house was this house. This house was being burglarized. We are told that no evidence was found linking Scott Peterson to the crime for which he was convicted and that the entire case was purely circumstantial. It is claimed that the Modesto Police Department zeroed in on Scott right after they reported that Lacey was missing, despite the lack of any evidence of a crime having been committed in their home or at Scott's warehouse. They explained that on the morning that Lacey went missing, the computer of Scott and Lacey Peterson appeared to have evidence that Lacey was online shopping for items on the couple's computer. One of their most explosive claims is that 11 different independent people witnessed a pregnant Lacey Peterson walking their dog Mackenzie well after Scott left to go fishing that day. We are told that Scott was honest with the cops and decided to go fishing that morning and that he went to great lengths to be helpful throughout his interactions with the police. Scott's defense team explains that the Peterson's mail carrier, who delivered the mail the day that Lacey's disappearance occurred at 10.38 a.m., never heard Mackenzie bark that day, something Mackenzie did on every day that he attempted to deliver the mail. This claim is believed to prove that Lacey was out walking the dog since Karen's service had returned Mackenzie to the house at 10.18 a.m. The brother and sister of Scott Peterson tells us that no one could know how they would react if they had lost a loved one or someone in their life that had gone missing and that we cannot judge Scott for his odd behavior and see it as proof of his criminality in this case. Lead defense counsel attorney Garagos explains to us that the boat that Scott took onto the Berkeley Marina that day couldn't have possibly been able to carry the nearly full-term body of Lacey Peterson and not have been seen by the various onlookers at the marina, and that it would have capsized when Scott attempted to push the anchored body over the edge. We hear that Scott had been falsely accused of making concrete anchors that were later alleged by law enforcement to have been used to weigh down Lacey's body, despite the fact that there was evidence that he had used the excess concrete to fill in a hole at his home. One of the most effective segments of the series shows us the incredibly damaging effect that Amber Frey had on Scott's case and how the public jumped to conclusions that because Scott had a mistress, then surely he must have wanted Lacey gone. Allowed Lacey's family to go on national television and defend him, all the while lying through his teeth about this affair. That was downright cruel. And I think it tells us something about his personality. It tells us something about his conscience. And finally, the primary argument heard countless times in this series is that the media tried and convicted Scott Peterson during their 24-hour media news cycle. That the media bias caused the general public to believe that he was guilty of a crime that had no biological or forensic evidence whatsoever. And if you were to add all of these details together, along with the various other arguments presented in the series, it appears to be an incredibly powerful narrative that seems to point to the innocence of Scott Peterson. So what happened? How was he convicted on a purely circumstantial case that did not have any forensic evidence whatsoever? I believe that what I have found in my research definitively answers that question. 
But in order to understand the answer with proper context, we have to start at the beginning and address the primary defense claims of Scott Peterson's innocence one by one. Number one, the case against Scott Peterson was entirely circumstantial. Exactly two years to the day prior to the disappearance of Lacey Peterson, just five hours away in Los Angeles, another homicide was being uncovered on Christmas Eve in the year 2000. The Beverly Hills Police Department had been notified of the execution-style homicide of Susan Berman. Susan had been the daughter of the infamous gangster David Berman, who had well-established ties to the mafia in his years operating the Flamingo Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. At the time, it was believed that Berman may have been the unfortunate collateral damage of her father's past lifestyle related to his regrettable ties to the mob. But several days after her homicide, the Beverly Hills Police Department would receive a letter with Susan Berman's address and the word cadaver written on the outside of the letter. Despite the homicide department's attempts to solve her vicious crime, it would sadly go on to become a cold case for nearly 15 years. Law enforcement was unable to find any forensic evidence or biological evidence, They found no murder weapon and no indisputable suspects were able to be definitively tied to the crime scene where Berman was found. But all of that would change when Andrew Jarecki made the film All Good Things, featuring Ryan Gosling and Kirsten Dunst. The movie was based on the life of Robert Durst, the once heir to the real estate dynasty of the Durst Organization. Durst would go on to participate in a documentary created by Jarecki that would culminate in a spectacular ending that would have the unintended outcome of solving the homicide of Susan Berman. You might be wondering how that was possible. Well, for those who haven't seen the Netflix documentary The Jinx, I highly recommend it. It has one of the most explosive endings of any documentary you will ever see in your life. But as a result of a single letter provided to the director, Andrew Jarecki, by Berman's stepson, it provided the link between Robert Durst and the homicide of Susan Berman. And this was accomplished simply because the handwriting of the word cadaver sent to the Beverly Hills Police Department in the year 2000 perfectly matched the handwriting and misspellings of Robert Durst. A case that had been cold for 15 years was solved using entirely circumstantial evidence, Evidence that had definitively connected Robert Durst to a crime that he had successfully obscured and avoided for over 15 years. In my many years of working with clients from all spectrums of societal backgrounds and experiences, I have frequently noticed a common misconception concerning the matter of circumstantial evidence. The pervasive idea seems to be that forensic and biological evidence should be found in a homicide and that forensic evidence, like DNA, is virtually a requirement in order to link an offender to the crime, and that without it, the case becomes entirely circumstantial. The word circumstantial has increasingly become viewed as synonymous with reasonable doubt amongst a surprisingly large majority of the general populace. And this is something we've discussed on this channel in the past a term referred to as the CSI effect, a reoccurring and increasingly pervasive belief that a criminal action involving a homicide must therefore also have compelling forensic evidence, and the absence of that evidence likely points to the innocence of the accused party. Unfortunately, that isn't always the case. More times than not, criminals who commit heinous crimes go to great lengths to attempt to cover them up, especially if they have the time, opportunity, and ability to do so. Many times, prosecutors only have circumstantial evidence available to them as a means to pursue justice because the perpetrator has gone to such great lengths to hide, obscure, and eliminate the evidence. But Robert Durst isn't the only example of an entirely circumstantial case that was solved. Another good example that involved circumstantial evidence is the case of Leonard Lake, a man who was one of the most vile and fiendish criminals of the 20th century. Leonard Lake and his accomplice Charles Ng committed heinous crimes that left law enforcement shocked at the extent of his inhuman brutality. Eventually, law enforcement took Lake into custody where he would demonstrate his cowardice of the justice system 
by way of successfully hiding cyanide pills from law enforcement. But before law enforcement could act, his accomplice Charles Ng would go on the run, fleeing California and finding his way into Canada. After several years, Canadian law enforcement would eventually catch Ng, and despite the enormity of the crimes that he had been accused of, he would successfully delay his prosecution for well over a decade. But even when his trial began, the case against him was seen as largely circumstantial. Since the prosecution didn't have any direct evidence of him committing the crimes for which he was now standing trial. Even though video evidence existed, they didn't have a smoking gun or any direct forensic evidence proving that he had personally harmed any of the victims that were later found on Leonard Lake's property. Law enforcement believed that great lengths had been taken to hide and obscure the evidence linking Ng to his crimes, but the circumstantial case against him was considerable, and the jury saw through his many attempts to escape and deny justice to his many victims. The jury would eventually convict and sentence Ng to death row at San Quentin, the same prison that he and Scott Peterson remain to this very day. Circumstantial cases are sometimes the only means a victim or their family has of obtaining justice, and if not for film director Andrew Jarecki, it is entirely likely that Robert Durst would have lived out the remainder of his days a free man. But a single letter, a letter that was likely thought to be completely inconsequential, changed the outcome of that case for good. A cold case lacking a forensic connection to the crime had been gifted compelling circumstantial evidence that clearly and profoundly established the guilt of Robert Durst, a man who was later convicted for the homicide of Susan Berman nearly 20 years later. But just because a circumstantial case can be enough to satisfy the burden of guilt, can the same be said of Scott Peterson's case? Is there compelling evidence in either direction that supports or rejects his claims of innocence? Let's review the facts. Number two, the Modesto Police Department focused on Scott Peterson from the very beginning despite the lack of evidence of a crime. Throughout the various iterations of the Peterson defense, it is often claimed that the Modesto Police Department unfairly honed in on Scott from the very beginning and never bothered to look at any other suspects in his wife's disappearance. Unfortunately, after a cursory review of the evidence, it quickly became apparent to me that this claim is entirely untrue. The Modesto Police Department did look into other suspects, including every single member of the family of both Scott and Lacey Peterson. This is known because we have recorded calls between the Roaches and the Peterson family where the police explain that they have cleared the family through an investigation of each person, but that they had been unable to clear Scott. In my career, I learned a number of important truths about the life of a law enforcement officer. Whenever we analyze a case within the true crime community, no matter how much we learn about it, we do so as lay people. But it is no substitution for what a homicide detective sees day after day. Over the years, I learned from many experienced veteran law enforcement officers that the most common party responsible for the disappearance of a spouse is often the spouse or someone close to them that the victim knew personally. It's widely known in the law enforcement community that the last person to see the victim alive is the very first person you want to speak with in connection to that disappearance. Statistically speaking, that person is often either responsible for the crime or knows details about the crime. While that isn't always the case, Volumes of criminal statistics shows that a vast majority of crimes involving a homicide are often committed by someone close to the victim. So the claim that the Modesto Police Department didn't consider any other suspects is patently untrue. In fact, they did consider the burglary that happened across the street to have some possible involvement in her disappearance, and they said so in a press conference. We have a witness that drove by the residence that lives in the area who saw a suspicious vehicle and some suspicious people. I feel that it's critical to either confirm it's involved with Lacey's disappearance 
or that it's, it's just a burglary. Records show that they conducted an investigation of those suspects and ultimately cleared them because there was no evidence that they had any involvement in her disappearance. Eventually in the docuseries, it's claimed that someone involved in the crime across the street also admitted to having involvement in Lacey's disappearance in a recorded call. But did you notice the call has never been produced? Additionally, no evidence of any kind, circumstantial or otherwise, was ever found linking those people to her disappearance or her eventual homicide. And more importantly, there's the ongoing issue of motive for which these thieves had none to commit such a violent and heinous crime against the pregnant mother. In my efforts to validate the claim that the Modesto police unfairly focused on Scott, I randomly came across something that happened mere hours after Lacey's disappearance was reported to police. On December 25th, just hours after their initial call, Scott Peterson calls homicide detective Brocchini and asks if they've used cadaver dogs yet. Detective Brocchini was shocked by the question and asked him, Scott, cadaver dogs are used for sniffing out dead bodies. Have you given up hope for finding Lacey alive? And Scott's response to his question was to say nothing at all. Now, I don't have to be a member of law enforcement to know just how suspicious that question is, because Scott had no reason to believe that Lacey was already deceased. And that question is not at all something that is commonly asked in a disappearance before there is any reason to suspect a homicide. That question alone would raise the suspicion of any law enforcement officer in that same situation. On the A&E Network, there is a show called The First 48. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the show, it is a series that follows real homicide detectives during the first 48 hours after a homicide. The entire premise of the show is that the first 48 hours is the most critical time frame of law enforcement's investigation and that a vast majority of the details concerning that case are determined within a matter of hours after the police become involved. So it's not only common for police to have a suspect in mind right away, it's the norm. Now, I am not suggesting that law enforcement as a whole be given a pass whenever they have a rush to judgment. What I am saying is that the narrative that Scott Peterson was an immediate suspect is not evidence of law enforcement's prejudice. In fact, the more I researched, the more I found that law enforcement officers who initially responded to the scene eventually got together and discussed a series of concerns that they had after they had spoken with Scott and several of Lacey's family members. The following are just some of their initial observations at the scene, as stated in their reports. They noticed that when they initially spoke with Scott, he could not answer what he was fishing for that day. Additionally, in that conversation, he volunteered a receipt from the Berkeley Marina, something that no one had asked him to do. Law enforcement was concerned that he never called police to report Lacey missing. Lacey's stepfather, Ron Gransky, did that. Their concerns were also heightened when they learned that Scott had come home from an unplanned fishing trip 90 minutes away, notices his wife's car is in the driveway, sees that she is nowhere to be found, sees evidence that someone has walked the dog who was wandering around in their backyard, and his first actions are to wash his clothes, take a shower, and eat pizza and milk? Detectives would also notice a bunched-up rug near the Peterson's back door. Officers noticed that it appeared as though something was dragged over the top of it. They also noticed that on the Peterson's bed, there was a large, body-like impression on it. But most concerning to law enforcement was the fact that Scott Peterson never once called Lacey after he said that he noticed that she was missing. He claims that he doesn't know where she was, and yet he doesn't bother to call his pregnant wife on her cell phone? I remember the first time that I read that. I really stopped what I was doing to think about that for a moment. You come home to an empty house. Your nearly full-term pregnant wife, who had a fainting spell recently in the park, is nowhere to be found. Her car is in the driveway, her shoes are in the house, and all of her other belongings are there as well and it never occurs to you to call her? According to Scott Peterson, he had no idea where Lacey was, 
So why wouldn't he have tried to call her on her cell phone? This is even more concerning when you realize that he had tried to call her at 2.15 on his way back from the marina. But once he gets home and realizes that Lacey is missing, his first call isn't to the police to report his wife missing. It's to Lacey's mother to tell her that she's missing. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the very definition of suspicious behavior. And if all you had seen was the A&E series, you might incorrectly believe that police had wrongly suspected Scott. But these issues were more than enough for any law enforcement agency to consider Scott a person of interest. And despite the enormity of everything we just learned, law enforcement still did not publicly list Scott as a suspect or as a person of interest for a considerable time after Lacey's initial disappearance. One of the other important elements of criminology that I have learned over the years is the importance of motive. Understanding motive is an important element in understanding a crime. A shockingly high percentage of cases that involve violent crimes have motive or someone involved who had reason to want to commit the crime. And I suspect as we continue down the list of claims of Scott's innocence, that motive is something we are going to want to keep at the forefront of our analysis. So let's continue. Number three, Lacey accessed the Peterson computer at around 8.40 a.m. on Christmas Eve, proving that she was alive that morning. In the docuseries, the various Peterson defenders portray this information as their smoking gun that completely disproves the case of the prosecution brought during the trial of Scott Peterson. According to the computer expert witness, 8.40 in the morning, she disappears. Someone is on the Peterson home computer looking at a sunflower umbrella stand and women's clothing. Lacey loves sunflowers. All her friends and family say that. Janie Peterson, the sister of Scott, exclaims how critical this discovery was during the trial because it proved that Lacey was alive that morning at 8.40 a.m. And if this were true, then it would leave Scott an insufficient window of time to commit the crime. When I watched this segment, I was struck at how compelling this was because, in fact, the prosecution seemed to contend that this may have actually happened. But do you know what I found? Looking at the trial record, I quickly realized that this claim is not even remotely accurate. Just moments before Lacey Peterson is supposedly online shopping, Scott Peterson logs onto his password-protected account and checks his private emails. And a few moments after Lacey was supposedly online shopping, we see Scott checking the weather at the Berkeley Marina. Playing the part of the devil's advocate, it could be argued that maybe Lacey jumped onto the computer in between Scott checking his email and checking the weather at the marina. But allow me to explain why that didn't happen. Because in the A&E series, we actually learn that Scott didn't even know that Lacey had used the computer that morning. But how in the world would that be possible when he's logged into his email, checking it, and then moments after she's supposedly online shopping, He's then checking the weather at the marina. But there's something even more important to understand about this entire issue, and that has to do with temporary internet files. Each and every time you view the internet, whether it's on your cell phone, on a desktop, a laptop, or any device, everything you look at is logged and stored into your web history. These files that are stored onto your web browser are referred to as temporary internet files. Now, back in December of 2002, the internet was a vastly different place than it is today. It was quite common to deal with pop-up advertisements from virtually every corner of the internet. Pop-up blockers had not yet become commonly used, and despite how annoying those ads may have been, they did leave a fairly distinct trail in your web browser. So even if you didn't click on the pop-up, they would still show up in your browser history. So to be perfectly clear, in 2002, a pop-up ad was not an indicator that you had specifically visited a website. More importantly, let's think about how online shopping actually works, even in 2002. Whenever you view a web page, every time you view something or click on anything or add an item into your cart, 
each and every page is also logged into your web history. So there would be far more than just a few entries in the web history if someone had been online shopping on the Peterson's computer that morning. Unfortunately, in 2002, internet technology wasn't well understood by the general public the way it is now. And sadly, the prosecution didn't understand that this alleged web history did not prove that Lacey was alive. It didn't prove any of the things that the defense claimed it did. However, since that time, it has been used in half a dozen documentaries as proof of something that never actually happened. Lacey Peterson did not go online shopping that morning, and it doesn't take a computer science degree to know that. And this revelation left me wanting to know one thing. If they aren't trying to use this information to convince the court that a mistake was made by way of an appeal then who are they trying to convince that Scott Peterson is innocent? Because this is now the third time we've uncovered a bogus claim made by the series, as well as those who defend Scott's innocence. But I, I wanted to be generous, because maybe they just didn't understand how computers work, or how internet browser history works. So let's evaluate the other smoking gun claims in the defense of Scott Peterson. Number four. 11 independent witnesses saw Lacey Peterson walking their dog Mackenzie after Scott left to go fishing that day. The claim that Lacey Peterson was seen by 11 different witnesses after Scott had already left to go fishing that day is made throughout the entire A&E documentary series. We are told that if Lacey had been seen by any one of those witnesses, that it would mean that Scott Peterson was actually innocent. And here's the thing, I actually agree with that statement. Scott would not have had enough time to commit the crime that he was convicted of if Lacey had been seen by any one of those people after he left the house just after 10 a.m. So I had to try and understand how it was possible that so many people had seen her and how Scott was still convicted despite their many claims. So once again, I dove into the record, reviewing the court transcripts, reviewing the various reports taken by those who claimed to have seen Lacey that day. And what I found left me completely stunned. Here are the facts. Shortly after Lacey's disappearance, a missing poster had gone out through the entire community, being shared absolutely all over Modesto. This is the poster that most people saw in their community, on the news, and all over the internet. A short time later, a reward was offered in connection to a lead that would solve her case, a monetary award of half a million dollars. Now, on the missing poster, you may notice that it says that she was wearing a white long sleeve shirt and black pants. And wouldn't you know it, the many independent witnesses claim to have seen Lacey wearing exactly that outfit long after Scott had left their house to go on a pleasant day of fishing. There is just one very big problem with all of that, and that's the fact that when Lacey's remains were found, she was wearing beige pants, not black. So these alleged sightings didn't even match the clothing that she was actually wearing at the time. Oh, and one other thing. Lacey's OBGYN testified that she had already stopped walking their dog because she had an episode where she nearly fainted in the park several weeks before. Her yoga teacher, her neighbors, her friends, and her mother all corroborated the fact that Lacey had stopped walking Mackenzie several weeks earlier. But as I was reading through the witness statements, I remembered a case that I had helped with many years back. It was concerning a family law dispute between two feuding parents. The mother was in the process of getting sold custody of her children from a father who had recently been arrested for kidnapping both of their children, but thanks to an Amber Alert, he had been caught attempting to flee the state. But for the multiple hours that he couldn't be found, the police had received several dozen tips from truckers, pedestrians, and other concerned citizens who swore that they had seen a man fitting his description driving the same color vehicle. However, despite the fact that law enforcement received nearly 40 leads from concerned citizens who believed in the validity of their sightings, not one of those leads were correct. 
Her ex-husband was eventually found at his stepmother's house and taken into custody when his stepmom contacted police to turn him in. And that experience taught me that false sightings are a common occurrence that sadly happen all the time. So often that it actually happened in another national case concerning the disappearance of a two-year-old toddler. In November 2008, the FBI received a tip concerning a toddler that had been missing for well over three months. The tipster said that she had been seen at a McDonald's 30 miles outside of Nashville, Tennessee. The FBI rushed into action and quickly reviewed the surveillance footage, but the passionate tipster, who had been completely convinced that they had seen Kaylee Marie Anthony, was in fact wrong. Each and every time any of Scott's supporters discuss his case, they tout these 11 witnesses as proof that Lacey was alive. In fact, Mark Garagos, the lead defense attorney, proclaimed in his opening statements at Scott Peterson's jury trial that he would bring those 11 witnesses before the jury to definitively and demonstrably prove that Lacey had been walking their dog that day, long after Scott had left the area to go on his unplanned fishing trip. But do you know what never happened? Mark Garagos never brought a single one of those witnesses before the jury. Not one. And he says that the reason he didn't bring any of those promised witnesses is because he had proved that Lacey was alive that morning at 8.40 a.m. But we already know that this claim wasn't true either. But I couldn't help but wonder if they were so confident that Lacey was alive and believed it proved Scott's innocence, then why in the world isn't any of his appeals based on the testimony of any of these 11 witnesses? Why wouldn't Scott file an appeal claiming ineffective assistance of counsel against Mark Garagos for failing to bring those witnesses in front of the jury? Well, attorney Garagos slipped up and told us why in his interviews throughout the series. Simply put, their testimony contradicts their statements. Some of them claim to see Lacey in different places at different times, and they all contradict each other. Attorney Garagos chose not to use their statements for a reason because he knew that they would not help his client. One thing my legal career has afforded me is an understanding of the legal process, the ins and outs of how it actually works. Because if this argument concerning these 11 witnesses was so compelling, Scott would have filed an appeal based on them by now. And that's how you know that it isn't an argument at all. But here we are, having uncovered the fourth time that claims from this series from supporters of Scott Peterson have failed to tell the whole truth. Claims that seemingly intend to intentionally mischaracterize the facts of this case. But I want to tell you something about me. My OCD nature now wants to know the whole truth about all of the claims they've made. And I'll just tell you this. I could have never guessed the totality of what I would find when I was finished reviewing the facts of this case. Number five, Scott Peterson was honest with police from the beginning and went to great lengths to help their investigation. Throughout the a and series, as well as various other interviews that Scott Peterson's family have agreed to participate in, they will say over and over how Scott was truthful and that he only ever lied a handful of times, but that if he did lie, he was quick to make efforts to correct those lies. The examples they give seem to place Scott in a favorable light. They demonstrate his efforts to be transparent and, if he messed up, that he was quick to fix those mistakes. But as you may have guessed by now, what I found was entirely different. On so many different occasions, Scott's supporters say that Scott decided to go fishing that morning, then he came home to an empty house and immediately began to notify everyone that Lacey had seemingly disappeared into thin air. But I'm starting to notice a pattern in the entirety of their claims, Because the notion that Scott decided to go fishing that morning is entirely and completely untrue. In all the documentaries that I've seen implying the innocence of Scott Peterson, I have never once heard them tell the whole truth about this specific claim. Because in actuality, Scott purchased his fishing license on December 20th, four entire days before he actually went fishing. So it wasn't a previously unplanned trip that he decided to take that morning 
because the license that he previously purchased was only good for December 23rd and 24th. The day he went fishing was literally the last day that he could legally fish on the marina on his new boat. Another lie he told was concerning what he did that day. He had explained that he went fishing with a silver lure for sturgeon, something that on its face seemed so completely unimportant. But later, law enforcement determined that wasn't true either, because when police searched his house and his boat, they found the only lures that he had anywhere in his possession and the box they were in were still closed and sealed from his original purchase. Additionally, he couldn't have been fishing for sturgeon that day because they weren't in season and it was illegal to fish for them during that time. But the lies didn't end there either. He told police that same night that he hadn't had any issues with his marriage and we all know that wasn't true. And just six hours after Lacey goes missing, before anyone has any idea that she isn't coming home, he asks Detective Brocchini for details to contact grief counselors. He had no reason to believe that Lacey wasn't coming home that same night for all he knew. So why in the world would he want the phone number for a grief counselor? Especially when you consider the fact that they are used by law enforcement to assist family whenever a loved one is found deceased. And if I were to tell you the number of times that Scott Peterson was caught in a provable lie, this video would be 12 hours long. But rest assured, we will discuss some of the more important lies that he told when we get to the prosecution side of this case. But I'm really hoping by now you're starting to see the issues I'm having with these claims, because each one of them is easily disproven. But out of morbid curiosity, I wanted to see if any of his claims hold any merit at all. Number six, the mail carrier never heard the Peterson's dog Mackenzie which indicates that Lacey was out walking the dog. This is one of the most commonly argued points any time I have ever seen public arguments in favor of Scott's innocence. It is often considered one of the smoking guns that proves that Lacey was out walking their dog well after Scott left their home to go fishing. The argument is predicated on the fact that Karen's service put their dog Mackenzie in their backyard at 10.18 a.m., and 20 minutes later, the mail carrier delivers the Peterson's mail, but never hears Mackenzie bark, something the dog did every time he delivered the mail. Scott's supporters claim that it clearly means that the dog wasn't home and therefore implies that Lacey was alive and had to have been outside walking him nearly 40 minutes after Scott had already left their house. And on its face, it seems compelling. Because if Mackenzie had just been placed in the backyard by Karen's service then why wasn't he barking as usual? But it doesn't take a monumental amount of effort to see the flaws in this argument. I am the proud owner of this beautiful beagle, and for the last several years, she has barked at every single person who has ever walked by my house. <coughs> Mail carriers, DoorDash deliveries, and anyone else who has dared to walk in front of her hallowed ground. <laughs> She barks with a passionate fury every single day without ever taking a single day off and does so with righteous indignation. Until the day she didn't. Just a few weeks ago, for no discernible reason whatsoever, she could see outside clearly as our neighbor walked directly in front of our house and she simply chose not to bark that day. In fact, she didn't bark at anyone else that walked by that day either. Maybe she was tired, or maybe she finally listened to my many attempts to train her, and it finally stuck. I can dream. But do you know what the mail carrier claim and now my story of my beagle is? It's anecdotal evidence, and it does not prove a single thing whatsoever. Which is why Scott's high-priced defense attorneys have never once attempted to bring it into any one of his appeals. Because it's not evidence, and it cannot be used as proof in any court proceeding, most especially not an appeal for a new trial. But I wanted to take it a step further and actually show you why I believe that this isn't an argument that proves Lacey was alive. Let's think about the situation logically for just a moment. And just for the sake of this analogy, let's say that Scott Peterson did in fact end the life of his wife Lacey. Now, I would imagine that even if the dog had been locked away in another room during the act, that eventually, Mackenzie was very much aware of what happened to Lacey. And if you've ever seen a dog that has lost one of its primary owners, they are deeply impacted by that loss. 
Their behavior changes so much, in fact, that it's not uncommon to see them laying around, seemingly heartbroken and acting very different than normal because of the trauma of what they now know. So it stands to reason that their dog Mackenzie would have had cause to act dramatically different than normal if Scott had ended the life of Lacey in that home. And speaking of the Peterson's animals, here's something I never heard anyone speak about in terms of his case. On the night of Lacey's initial disappearance, Scott told police that when he got home, he opened the back door and let the dog and cat inside. And then he said something that most people didn't seem to realize the importance of, but I noticed it from the moment it left his mouth. Since I was a young child, my parents have always owned cats, but they were always outdoor cats. And there is a massive difference between cats that live outdoors and cats that live indoors. But every now and then, whenever my mom would prepare a turkey or be cooking with a whole chicken, I would take some of those scraps and give them to the outdoor cats. And let me tell you, those cats would come running from blocks away at the mere scent of blood. Why? Because cats are carnivores, and it doesn't matter what kind of blood it is, they'll come running. And when you consider how much cats hate water, the fact that his cat would come running over to the bucket is nothing short of reasonable suspicion. Now, is it evidence that could have been used in court? No. But do you now see how anecdotal evidence can be used to convey whatever narrative you want to push people towards? But just in case it isn't clear, this argument about the mail carrier isn't one. But here we are, six claims into their proof of his innocence, and not one of them holds to any measure of scrutiny. But I will commit to this. If we can find that even one of the arguments in support of his innocence has any merit... I will gladly admit that reasonable doubt existed in his case. So let's continue. Number seven, Scott Peterson was aloof, but no one can know how they would react in that same situation. And his behavior was not proof of criminality. I think everybody sitting at home wants the answer to the same question. Did you murder your wife? No, no, uh, I did not. And I had absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. And and use the word murder, and yeah, I mean, that is a, a possibility. Um, it's not one we're ready to accept, and it creeps in my mind late at night and early in the morning. There was a poignant moment in the A&E docuseries where attorney Mark Garagos exclaims that in his entire career, he has learned that observing the way someone acts is not a reliable marker for determining guilt. And surprisingly, I actually agree with him, to an extent. Guilt or innocence should never be formed solely based on how a suspect reacts to a crime. Doing so can result in false confessions or incorrect assumptions that can have a profoundly negative effect on an ongoing investigation. But as much as we may want for criminality to be solely determined based on scientific-based forensics, the reality of solving crimes often does involve observations that are centered around intuition, experience, and common sense, as well as observing the evidence as a whole. It is true that not everyone reacts the same way to trauma, and that some people do not express grief in the same way. But there was a segment of this documentary that left me questioning the intent of this series as a whole. Maureen Orth works for Vanity Fair and is one of the pundits seen throughout the series, and she begins to chastise the American public's way of handling grief whenever these kinds of cases are picked up by the 24-hour news cycle. One of the things that was interesting to me as a journalist was what matters are people's feelings and how terrible they feel, and if they cry, it's so much better. It's really just having a national pageant of grief in which everybody can participate and stare at all the grief and the tears and speculate about all the salacious details. Now, we can all agree that the media today has departed from the previous models of journalism embodied by the greats who were purely interested in reporting the news, men and women who went to great lengths to remain objective and simply report the news free of their own personal and subjective opinions. And we can also agree that the media tends to only focus on missing people who fit a certain profile. 
but that doesn't change the fact that something tragic did happen in the matter of Lacey Peterson. And the arguments against the public's reaction to Lacey's initial disappearance misses the incredible importance of empathy. When you really analyze Maureen's statement, it comes across as one of the most overt displays of gaslighting I have seen in any recent documentary. Because I've listened to countless interviews by people who volunteered to help search for Lacey, and it would be fair to say that a vast majority of the people who took interest in this case were fueled by their empathy for Lacey, for Connor, and for the Rocha family. And believe it or not, even for Scott. The public took interest in this case because we could all agree that the loss of her life was a pain that no family should ever endure. It wasn't just some pageant of grief. People coalesced around this case because in some way we could all see ourselves in it. We could see our own daughters, sisters, and mothers, and we could all agree that it was something that should never happen to anyone. And when people claim that the public's response was somehow an overreaction, it completely takes away everything we've learned about Scott after Lacey's disappearance. Scott Peterson wasn't merely aloof, smiling at wildly inappropriate moments, because his actions speak louder than anything he has to say. He lacked empathy for someone he claimed to love and routinely failed to show any sign that he actually cared about Lacey being gone. Within a few weeks of Lacey's disappearance, he contacted a real estate agent to put their house on the market. Long before anyone knew that she was deceased, he was already selling their home with everything in it, furnished with all of Lacey's furniture. Additionally, Scott ordered hardcore adult content that was only viewable in their living room just days after she went missing. Really think about that for a second. He orders an extremely explicit adult television channel to his living room TV while still expecting his nearly full-term pregnant wife to come home? And oh, don't forget the fact that he canceled those channels on the same day that police executed a search warrant at his house. But wait, there's more. Within a few weeks of her disappearance, he sold her car. Why would someone who is looking for his wife, who claims over and over that she will come home safe and sound, why would he sell her only form of transportation? And it doesn't stop there either. He then spent months refusing to give her parents any of her childhood keepsakes, and then once Lacey and Connor were found, he wouldn't give police her dental information so that they could verify it was her through her dental records. Instead, he told police that he couldn't remember who her dentist was, despite the fact that they went to the same dentist. Oh, and let's not forget the fact that he was having an affair with Amber Fry. Frey, Fry, we'll call her Fry. But for the record, phonetically, it's Frey, but I digress. But while Scott was having an affair with Amber, he also made plans to raise her daughter with her, even gifting her a book to Amber's daughter that had originally been gifted to Lacey at her baby shower. Really stop for a second and listen to what I just said. Scott and Lacey Peterson had been gifted a book for their son Connor at Lacey's baby shower. And during a time when Lacey was missing and still believed to be alive, he gives that book for his unborn son to his mistress's daughter? If he believed Lacey was ever coming home, why in the world would he have done that? And don't forget that he never participated in a single public event to find Lacey. He was routinely seen taking down pictures that featured both him and Lacey in them at the Volunteer Center. And anytime the media showed up, he would make sure that no pictures of him were taken, slipping out the back door before anyone could speak with him. So often in missing person cases, people that have a missing loved one cannot buy media attention and have to resort to begging for anyone to help them to find their loved one. Those people would do absolutely anything to have the kind of media attention that Scott Peterson had to try and locate Lacey. And there he is with the media beating his door down, trying to help him, and he wants nothing to do with any of it. But for me, one of the most compelling and outright damning elements of Scott Peterson's behavior happened after he was convicted for their homicide. 
Despite his conviction, he would go on to sue the family of Lacey Peterson because he believed he was owed the $250,000 they received from her life insurance policy. And even when the court ruled against him, deciding that the money should go to Lacey's family, he didn't leave it there. He appealed the ruling and continued to fight them for the money. He would eventually lose the appeal, but not after forcing Lacey's family to defend themselves in court, shelling out tens of thousands of dollars in legal expenses, fighting the man who was convicted of their daughter's homicide. And here's the thing, I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the innumerable times where Scott Peterson failed to show any sign of concern or empathy for his missing wife. So the next time a member of Scott's family or one of his supporters says that you can't know how you would react, here's what I do know. I wouldn't act like Scott Peterson did. Because while his behavior isn't indisputable proof of guilt, it does give us clear insight into a man who seemed to be largely unconcerned about the whereabouts of his pregnant wife, Lacey. Number eight. Scott Peterson was seen by several people at the Berkeley Marina, and people who saw him that day did not see a body inside his boat. Additionally, his boat was too small, and Lacey would have been too heavy to push into the harbor without capsizing the boat. Initially, before I did any research on this case, this was one of the few arguments that I was most concerned about, because on the surface, it would seem to be a compelling argument. But as I scoured the internet, I came across the Crime Piper blog. The blog is run by some of the most knowledgeable and intelligent people on the topic of Scott Peterson. And what they extrapolated from the court record leaves no doubt to the validity of this claim. They helped fill in the blanks when I sought to understand whether or not this claim was in fact a problem for those who firmly believed in Scott Peterson's guilt. So here are the facts. The following is a picture of Scott Peterson's boat taken from a court exhibit. And as you can see, a woman who was roughly the same size as Lacey Peterson was able to get into the bottom of Scott's boat and remain unseen even at a fairly high angle. In the trial of Scott Peterson, it was revealed that he had tarps on top of his boat at the time that he was hauling it to the marina. So there is no reason to think that anyone looking inside his boat would have seen anything other than a tarp. Also, let's really think logically about this situation for a moment. If you had been at the Berkeley Marina that day, there's no reason to look at Scott Peterson, then look inside his boat to see if there's anything incriminating inside of it. He was a well-groomed young man, who many have described as being handsome and easy on the eyes. So why would anyone be looking in his boat to ascertain if there was anything inside of it that could implicate him in a crime before Lacey was even reported missing? That is completely absurd, and it assumes that people who saw him that day could have had any idea what they were even looking at, even if they had looked inside his boat. Furthermore, do you know what else I found in researching his case? That when Scott Peterson went looking to buy a boat, despite the fact that money was tight and they did not have any extra money to waste on a new boat, that Scott took out most of their savings to buy that boat for $1,400. I also learned that Scott was very specifically looking for a boat that had a depth finder on it. And in case you don't know what that is, it's a device that uses ultrasonic waves to determine the depth of fish below you. So the deeper the fish, the further down the bottom of the lake is, or in this case, the ocean. Scott even looked at larger boats but chose not to buy them because they lacked the depth finder that he wanted. And the argument that he would have capsized his boat trying to remove the remains of Lacey is total nonsense. Scott told police that very first night that he was out sturgeon fishing that day. Well, I might not be a professional angler, but I do know a thing or two about fishing, and one thing I know with certainty is that sturgeon are massive fish. They can get to be well over 500 pounds, and the average sturgeon is no less than 50 pounds. I've been on the same kind of boat that Scott was on, with several large men, all at the same time while fishing, and somehow me and tens of thousands of others who go out on boats every day of the week somehow find a way to keep from capsizing. 
In the series, Attorney Garrigo shows this video that he failed to get entered into evidence. As you can see, the man in it struggles to simulate the alleged actions of Scott Peterson and eventually falls into the water. But this video was ruled to be inadmissible because it shows the man in the video with his foot on the side of the boat, seemingly intentionally trying to end up in the water, something that an angler would never do. And again, all we need to do is think logically about this situation. No one in their right mind wants to end up in the San Francisco Bay in the middle of December. It has claimed countless lives because of how notoriously cold those waters are. Simply put, Scott Peterson had reason to stay out of the water that day. And nothing about this argument is compelling. And it's why the jury ultimately disregarded it. Because like so many of the previous points, this is not proof. It's anecdotal evidence that wouldn't pass a Mythbusters test, let alone be seen as primary evidence in a jury trial. And here we are, having reviewed most of the primary arguments in support of his innocence. And I'll be honest, by this point in my research, I started to get really frustrated. Because so many of these claims have been portrayed as proof without any further scrutiny. And I wanted to understand why. But before I could answer that question, I had to know, was there any evidence that actually pointed towards the innocence of Scott Peterson? Number 9. Scott Peterson was falsely accused of making multiple anchors, despite evidence that proved that he disposed of the excess concrete on the side of his house to fill a hole. In the A&E docuseries, they use this argument as one of the many that seems to show that police jumped to false conclusions and the frenzied media had incorrectly judged Scott Peterson. Throughout the series, Nancy Grace plays the role of the antagonistic villain, often shown as one of the lone voices in opposition to his innocence. They go on to show a moment in the series that is seemingly meant to demonstrate her incorrect bias, and that even when she was shown evidence that disproved her theories, that she refused to acknowledge her mistake. And there, someone had very clearly poured a bunch of cement powder. I called Nancy Grace over, and I said, look, there's the cement. She says, huh, walked away, never mentioned it on the show, never went back on the air and said, oh, you know that whole thing I said about uh, he was lying about the concrete? Turns out I was wrong. He really did. That didn't happen. This series isn't just an attempt to exonerate Scott Peterson. It seemingly also seeks to firmly place the idea that the media is fully overrun by biased pundits and reporters and that Nancy Grace is one of the worst among them. They even go so far as to show her backstory that included her telling of how she lost her former partner due to a homicide and that her overzealous opinions seem to be fueled by her blind rage to go after anyone she deems a criminal. Once again, I couldn't help but notice how if all you had seen is this series, you would likely walk away thinking that Nancy Grace and the media were all bad actors who only cared for ratings, clicks, and money. Especially after what we see appears to be fairly damning evidence that not only exposes the media, but piggybacks on the recent wave of disdain for Nancy Grace by the general public. Scott Peterson had purchased 90 pounds of concrete prior to his day of non-fishing for sturgeon on the Berkeley Marina. But allow me to repeat that one more time. 90 pounds of concrete. Now, Scott claimed that he made only one single 8-pound anchor from that 90-pound bag. Now, I have to admit, I'm not a mathematician, but I'm pretty sure my calculations are correct. And that if Scott made an 8-pound anchor... That would leave, uh, carry the two, 82 pounds of dry concrete. But the A&E series shows this picture. This picture as being proof that Scott had in fact gotten rid of the rest of the concrete on the side of his house. But I have a question. Does that look like 82 pounds of concrete to you? Because I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and make a fairly bold statement. Despite the fact that I don't have a degree in structural engineering... But, I mean, I did minor in the obvious and say that that is absolutely not 82 pounds of concrete on the side of Scott Peterson's house. And, of course, the series very conveniently forgets to mention that Scott told multiple stories about how he used or got rid of the concrete. 
Initially, he told law enforcement that he threw the concrete away. And then he said he didn't know what he did with it, finally landing on dumping the dry concrete into a hole on the side of his house. The series also forgets to mention that law enforcement found evidence of concrete inside of Scott's boat and his truck. The kind of concrete debris that you would expect to find if someone had made multiple anchors and then placed them in their truck and then in Scott's boat. Throughout this series, I noticed a reoccurring theme, as though they wanted to ride the wave of the recent media distrust, placing the idea firmly in the minds of us, the viewers, that maybe we are the victims of an intentional campaign to manipulate us by the media into seeing something in Scott that wasn't there. Because if the media was willing to lie to us about all these various aspects of the world around us, it's not a stretch to think that they had misrepresented the truth concerning Scott as well. But towards the end of my research, what I found in the next segment changed the way that I saw the Scott Peterson case for good. Number 10. Scott Peterson's affair with Amber Fry caused the general public to wrongly jump to conclusions concerning his guilt. From the very beginning of my review of this case, I knew that if there was any claim that seemed to hold the most considerable weight, it was the assertion that Scott Peterson was largely viewed as guilty once it was revealed that he was having an affair with Amber Fry. It made sense to me that the general public had made assumptions about his guilt once she was brought to the forefront, and my goal was to try to determine if his affair had wrongly contributed to his conviction. In the A&E series, as well as others that have been created in the last six years, attorney Mark Garagos has played an important role in helping to lay the foundation for the claims of Peterson's innocence. And regardless of what anyone may think of him, he is a masterful criminal defense attorney, and he best demonstrates that skill with what he says in this next segment. Was he a scoundrel? Was he a cad? Yes, I get that. But if you're going to put into prison every married man who has an affair while their wife is eight or nine months pregnant. Um... Now, just for a moment, I want to deconstruct what he just said, because he takes something that we all know is unacceptable, a married man with a pregnant wife having an affair, and he places it against the backdrop of prison. Because surely we can all agree that adultery is immoral, and we can also all agree that we can't just send every man who has an affair to prison. Because in that case, there would have to be a lot more prisons built, and only the most unreasonable person could possibly think something that extreme. He essentially forces the listener to agree with him, and it's one of the many reasons why I have such a problem with this kind of non-argument. Because no one has ever said that Scott Peterson should go to prison because he had an affair. That's not even remotely at issue in this case, and attorney Garagos knows that. But he reframes the discussion in a way that forces even the most ardent defenders of Scott's guilt to have to agree with his statement. It comes off as this Christopher Nolan-esque form of inception, because it plants the idea that Scott only had an affair, and that was the motivating reason for why he was ultimately convicted. Simply because the American public was angry at him for cheating on his pregnant wife. But Scott Peterson wasn't charged with adultery. He was charged with the homicide of Lacey and Connor Peterson. But allow me to share with you the most compelling evidence that I uncovered in my investigation specific to this issue of Scott Peterson's affair. I took the time to listen to all of the various audio recordings of Scott and Amber's conversations, additionally taking the time to study the whole backstory of their relationship, and I believe that it's a story that you need to hear in order to understand how critically important it is. Amber Fry was introduced to Scott Peterson by a mutual friend, Sean Sibley, who had just met Peterson at a work conference in early November of 2002. A short time later, Scott asked Sean if she had any single friends, and eventually she gave Amber's information to Scott so that they could meet up. Both Sean and Amber believed that Scott was a single man because that's what he had told them. Amber's first date with Scott was an all-night affair that went until the following morning and had gone exceedingly well. Soon after, things began to progress very quickly with Scott who met her for multiple weekend-long dates, including picking up her 18-month-old daughter from daycare, picking out a Christmas tree for her, discussing plans to meet her parents, and ultimately to get married. 
And from the beginning, Scott was adamant with Amber that he did not want children, something he had even said previously to his wife Lacey years before. And these infamous pictures taken of Scott and Amber at her Christmas party happened on the same night that Lacey was forced to go alone to her Christmas party because Scott had told her that he was meeting with his boss who had just flown in from Europe unexpectedly. But of course, in actuality, he spent the night with Amber at her boss's company party, leaving his nearly full-term pregnant wife by herself. But what happened on December 8th, 2002, changed the way that I saw this case forever. Amber's friend Sean had heard from an acquaintance that Scott Peterson was actually married. So she called Scott and angrily confronted him. She told Scott that she was going to call Amber and tell her the truth about him. But Scott pleaded, begged with her not to do that. Instead, he negotiated that he would call Amber and tell her the truth himself. And sure enough, Scott Peterson calls Amber and tells her that he has something very important that he needs to talk to her about. And the following day, he comes to her house and he was nearly inconsolable. Amber recounts the story by saying that he was hysterically crying, talking about how he hadn't told her the whole truth, that in fact he had been married, but that he had lost his wife, and that this would be the first Christmas without her. Weeks before Lacey Peterson would actually go missing, Scott was claiming that she was already gone. And that's the story that most of us familiar with this case have already heard. But were you aware that on the same day that Amber's friend Sean had called Scott demanding that he tell Amber the truth, that his computer logged something rather curious? The very same day that Sean called Scott to confront him, threatening to end his relationship with his new girlfriend, Scott Peterson searches the weather conditions at the Berkeley Marina. Specifically, the tidal patterns in the harbor where Lacey and Connor were eventually found. When I read that for the first time, I stopped what I was doing and tried to find any reasonable explanation for why Scott would do that. And then it just became obvious. Scott was being threatened with losing Amber if he doesn't tell her the truth about being married. And that same day, he starts looking at the tidal patterns for the exact same area where Lacey and Cotter would be found. If this were a Hollywood movie, it would get horrendous critic reviews for being entirely too predictable, because this is the literal age-old definition of motive. And just hours after the confrontation with Sean, he goes to Amber Fry's house and puts on an act where he is able to excessively cry on command, saying that he lost his wife, a wife who is still very much alive. And I've thought a lot about this part of his case. The fact that Scott is able to manipulate and lie to Amber virtually on command, but more specifically, the issue of how upset he was and how he was unable to stop crying as he makes a wildly false declaration. In numerous interviews, Amber discusses how inconsolable he was, but the ability to manufacture emotion over something that wasn't even true is precisely why his affair was so problematic. Not because of the salacious details, but because of what it said about Scott's character. But in all of the various docuseries that have been made defending Scott, they all portray this affair as being nothing more than tabloid gossip that incorrectly prejudiced the world against Scott. But that simply isn't true. The problem that the world had with Scott was his actions, or the lack thereof, and how those actions directly correlated to a man's behavior who continually demonstrated a lack of empathy for any of the people he claimed to love. But there are dozens of hours of conversations between Amber and Scott that completely contradict that claim. But after watching all six episodes of the A&E series, I noticed that it was filled to the brim with these kinds of ridiculous arguments. Everything that points to Scott's guilt is somehow incorrect or a rush to judgment propagated by the media. And every possible thing that could even remotely make Scott look favorable is used as evidence that he is in fact innocent. Apparently, we are expected to ignore all of the things that point to his guilt and only pay attention or give credence to the things that demonstrates his innocence. But they can't have it both ways, especially when the evidence consistently and continually disproves every aspect of their claims. 
And here we are, well over an hour into this video, and I haven't even started telling you any of the prosecution's case yet. But if you're still unconvinced in either direction, don't worry, because I'm not even close to being done yet. Number 11. Police failed to follow up on credible leads or investigate the strikingly similar case of Evelyn Hernandez. In the a &E series, former defense attorney Matt Dalton gives one of the most impassioned arguments in favor of Scott's innocence. He tells us about a similar crime that was committed just a few months before the disappearance of Lacey. A young pregnant woman named Evelyn Hernandez was eventually found deceased on the shores of the San Francisco Bay Area in close proximity to where Lacey and Connor would later be found. And Evelyn's remains would be found in a very similar condition as that of Lacey's. And this information leaves the implication that someone in the same area could have been responsible for the death of Lacey and that police failed to properly investigate a crime that had many of the same hallmarks of criminality. Attorney Dalton makes the claim and we are left with the inference that so many aspects of this case weren't properly explored. That maybe someone else had something to do with Lacey's crime because we find out that Evelyn's homicide is still a cold case and that it has never been solved. And if you lived on an island where only the A&E channel was available, then it would be entirely understandable why you could see this segment and feel that it was compelling. In fact, when attorney Dalton begins to explain the similarity of Evelyn's case to Lacey's, it's one of those moments that leaves you thinking, wow, someone else may have committed this crime. I remember the first time I saw that segment thinking exactly that, and being shocked that I hadn't heard anything about this case until over a decade after Scott's conviction. And I contend that is why a vast majority of people who believe that Scott may be innocent believe it, because they only hear surface-level information provided to them by the series and never really go beyond that. But I did, and reading the news articles about Evelyn Hernandez, I sat there shaking my head in complete disbelief. Evelyn Hernandez was the mistress of Herman Aguilera, a married man just like Scott Peterson. In the investigation, police determined that Evelyn had recently broken up with Herman Aguilera and that she was pregnant with his baby, a baby that he would have been financially responsible for while being married to a different woman entirely. It's been reported that he wanted to maintain control over Evelyn's life that he wanted to keep access to her home, and ultimately, it was believed that he wasn't happy about her choice to end the relationship. And the tragic part of her case is no one seemed to care that she went missing. She didn't get the same news coverage, and sadly, it wasn't just her and her unborn child that lost their lives. She had a son who has never been found since her initial disappearance. Sadly, Evelyn's case was never solved, and she deserves justice but she does not deserve to be used as a pawn to try and infer guilt on someone other than Scott Peterson. And after reviewing the entire case file that I could get my hands on, I saw considerable evidence that supports that law enforcement did run down hundreds of thousands of leads and that they investigated everyone close to Lacey, as well as people in the neighborhood, and that they clearly determined that no one else had reason, motive, and opportunity to harm Lacey Peterson. And that's precisely why Scott Peterson paid attorney Mark Garagos $1 million to defend his life in a jury trial because the evidence that supported his motive and opportunity was compelling. And this series doesn't seem to want to address the fact that attorney Garagos failed to provide any reasonable suspect to the jury other than his client that could have had motive and opportunity to harm Lacey Peterson. And after going through each of these claims one by one, reviewing all of their key arguments without having found any compelling evidence pointing to his innocence, I purposefully saved their biggest argument for last. And it is one of the most ominous claims that the defenders of Scott Peterson have made from the very beginning. Number 12. Despite the total lack of forensic and biological evidence, the media still tried and convicted Scott Peterson. This is the single most explosive claim made throughout every iteration of any docuseries made in favor of Scott's innocence. 
It is repeated time and time again at virtually every opportunity, and by the time you've watched every episode of the series, it seems that they have made a compelling case that Scott Peterson was found guilty by virtue of the negative media attention long before he ever set foot in court. Over and over, we are told that no forensic or biological evidence has ever existed in this case. And again, we are faced with arguments that seem truly persuasive and convincing. And for me, it preys on my inherent desire to be empathetic to all people. Because it presents the idea that maybe members of the public did jump to conclusions. And that maybe there isn't evidence beyond a man who was morally bankrupt but who didn't actually commit these unspeakable acts. We are bombarded with the idea that we need to question what we believe, which is actually an important part of being a human. To never be unwilling to analyze our positions, to be able to admit when we are wrong, which are all inherently good things. And in various moments of the series, I was willing to admit that I was wrong and that I had seen proof of Scott's unfair conviction by the media and that there may have been reasonable doubt in his case. That was until attorney Chris Pixley said these words. A piece of Lacey's hair, on a pair of pliers that were rusted shut. And I would hope that his wife's hair is at his workplace. I would hope that he had his wife's hair on some of his clothes. Now, if it isn't clear by now, I am completely disgusted with this series and all others like it. Because every single time I look at any of their claims under a microscope, I find that they have either left things out, misconstrued the facts, or seem to be intentionally misrepresenting details that are always slanted towards defending Scott Peterson. No matter how bad the facts look, someone from his defense team always seems to have an excuse. And let me explain why I feel the way that I do about this issue specifically. Because those pliers were found inside of Scott Peterson's boat the same boat that is believed to have carried the remains of Lacey Peterson. And the hair isn't on the pliers, it's in those closed pliers, a very important distinction. And he also claims that they are rusted shut. Now, I've owned a lot of pliers in my day, and those are clearly not rusted shut. And do you know what's comical about all of this? Didn't they say over and over that there was no forensic or biological evidence found in the Scott Peterson case? Well, then I have a question. What is hair? Didn't they find that the hair in those pliers came from a human body? And then doesn't that hair need to be tested to verify its origin? And what's that process called whenever they send something involved in a crime for testing? Uh, Oh, right. Forensics. So literally every single time that we've been told that there's no forensic or biological evidence ever found in this case, it is a complete and total fabrication. There was no biological evidence, no forensic evidence whatsoever. Furthermore, law enforcement found Scott Peterson's fresh blood on their bed. And I'm pretty sure, don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure blood also counts as forensic evidence. And all of this information was presented at the trial of Scott Peterson to the jury. Now, over the years, many of Scott Peterson's defenders have talked about the hair having mitochondrial DNA that was linked to Sharon Rocha, the mother of Lacey Peterson. But you'll probably notice that attorney Chris Pixley, a man who is in every Scott Peterson documentary vehemently defending him, doesn't even make that distinction because it's accepted that it was Lacey's hair. So one of the most commonly repeated phrases in defense of Scott Peterson is patently untrue. And while these certainly aren't all of the claims that were made in the docuseries, there remains only one other statement that requires our review. And this claim was saved for last on purpose. The evidence that Scott Peterson was convicted in the eyes of the media is portrayed in the multitude of examples presented to us in this series. But I notice we never hear about the numerous times that defense attorney Garagos used that same media to spread his own narratives about the case. In one hand, They condemn the media, and in the other, they use it to their advantage. In virtually every example that they use showing that the media is crucifying Scott, it is also accompanied by a defense attorney like Mark Garagos and Chris Pixley who would loudly defend Scott at every possible opportunity. In fact, it's precisely because of the fact that attorney Garagos was seen in the media so often 
directly defending Scott on so many various occasions that his family would eventually go on to hire him to represent Scott. Attorney Garagos isn't afraid to use the media that he condemns as the cause of convicting Scott Peterson and then utilize the same tactics to try and exonerate him. But as I watched the series, I began to notice something very odd, something that seemed out of place. Do you remember this man, Attorney Matt Dalton? Because he's the man in the series that is one of the most passionate defenders of Scott Peterson virtually every time he's on camera. He can be heard practically scoffing that anyone could possibly believe that Scott was guilty. But do you ever notice that we're never really told who he is? At the very beginning of the documentary, he claims that the police looked in the wrong home for evidence of Lacey's homicide, and in fact, it was the house across the street that they should have been canvassing. And never mind the fact that no actual evidence is ever provided that links that burglary to Lacey's homicide, but it's Attorney Dalton's relationship to this case that is something that I find very peculiar when viewed with this next segment of Attorney Garagos' interview. Scott Peterson's legal team is trying to shift blame to some murky satanic cult. I had an associate who was working on the case and he became convinced of this theory. He started running with it and then the tabloids and cable news shows went crazy with it. You may notice that Attorney Garrigo seems to want to distance himself from the satanic cult theory, which is kind of strange considering the fact that he used the theory in his opening statement at Scott's trial and then never once brought any direct evidence to support that totally wild and unfounded theory. A theory that claimed that Satanists had abducted Lacey as part of some satanic ritual, a claim that has aged like milk. And what I find so interesting about this whole segment is when Mark Garagos refers to the person who peddled this wild theory as an associate of his law firm. We find out later that this associate is someone he hired to help him represent Scott Peterson. And this unnamed associate apparently ran with this crazy theory, which then caused the media and tabloid frenzy. But I thought it was very odd that he never names that attorney because he's talking about attorney Matt Dalton, the same person who defends the theory mere moments later, despite it being characterized as tabloid nonsense, which it was. So I started to dig a little deeper, and what I found was nothing short of unbelievable. Attorney Matt Dalton was fired by Mark Garagos, and his firing came shortly after Dalton ignored a court-imposed gag order and went ahead and spoke with Modesto area journalists, despite the court mandating that he not speak with the media. Later, when attorney Dalton wrote a book about the Scott Peterson case, Mark Garrigo sued him to try and stop him from publishing anything about his former client. Unfortunately, Garagos's lawsuit failed and Dalton was allowed to publish his book. But in Dalton's book, he claims that he was fired because he tried to take the Peterson's case away from Garagos and deliver it to a different law firm altogether. And that was why he was eventually fired. But what's clear about this entire interaction is both men are doing their level best to hide the fact that they have both faced off in court as adversaries and that Mark Garrigo sued him for what he claimed was unethical behavior on the part of attorney Matt Dalton. And all of this matters because it demonstrates how these passionate defenders of Scott Peterson utilize information to convey a story that they are trying to convince you of. They seemingly pick and choose which narrative suits them best and omit any details that could possibly negatively impact their version of events. They carefully construct a convincing story that preys on your views, knowing full well that they are leaving out information that reflects poorly on the entirety of their arguments. And it leaves me wanting to ask a very simple question. Isn't that exactly what they are accusing the media of doing? And after all this time, I realized that I wasn't able to corroborate a single claim that has been made by the supporters of Scott Peterson. I have not found any evidence that leans in his favor. And you may be asking yourself, why does it even matter? When so many people were already convinced that Peterson was guilty, I asked myself the question, why go through this just to prove something that so many people already believe. I promise you, 
that by the time I end this video, I will answer that question in a way that I believe will prove why this presentation this way was and is so important. However, before I do, I am going to present in the most concise way that I can the prosecution's case against Scott Peterson. The People versus Scott Peterson The jury trial of Scott Peterson took nearly six months, and despite the overwhelming media coverage, the court did not allow cameras or recording devices. This presented something of a unique challenge for my team, but over the last four weeks, we reviewed hundreds of hours of trial transcripts, evidence, court records, and anything else related to the proceeding that we could find. And what we learned was that the prosecution brought a compelling case against Scott Peterson. In total, the state brought 174 witnesses to testify during their presentation of their case against Peterson. And despite the many claims of Scott's innocence by attorney Garagos, he would only call 14 witnesses to the stand. And a vast majority of those witnesses had already been called previously by the state. These are the primary arguments and points brought against Scott Peterson by the prosecution during his trial. This list does not include all of the previously mentioned points of evidence already discussed in this episode, which are considerable. The prosecution's case was as follows. Scott Peterson was believed to have committed the homicide of Lacey Peterson sometime between the evening of December 23rd and the morning of December 24th, 2002. Peterson was the last person to see Lacey alive. He was believed to have committed the crime in a way that would have left little to no biological evidence and that he would have had ample time to clean up afterward. The Petersons had just had their home cleaned by a maid service who had just mopped the floors the day before. So the presence of a mop and bucket at the crime scene was thought to be out of place considering the house had just been cleaned. Scott Peterson went on a planned trip to the Berkeley Marina over 90 minutes away on Christmas Eve when he was supposed to be back in the area to pick up a gift basket before 3.30 p.m. He didn't leave his home until after 10 a.m. Scott Peterson was fishing in the same area where Lacey and Connor would eventually be found. And on the morning of Christmas Eve, Susan Medina, the Peterson's neighbor, saw Scott loading something large wrapped in a blue tarp into his vehicle at 9.55 a.m. just before he left for the Berkeley Marina. When Scott returned home from his fishing trip that day, he noticed that Lacey's car was still in the carport. He walked inside and saw that she was not home. He then proceeded to put his clothing in the laundry took a shower and waits over 30 minutes before he calls Lacey's mother to notify her that she's missing. Even after Scott verifies that she's not at the neighbor's house or anywhere else, he never once attempts to contact police or notify them of her disappearance. And more importantly, Scott never tried to call Lacey after he arrived home because it's believed that he already knew that she was deceased. After the family's initial search for Lacey in the park, Scott told Lacey's mother, Sharon, You know, if they find blood anywhere, that doesn't mean anything. I'm a sportsman. Just look at my hands. I could drop blood anywhere. Law enforcement would later notice that evening that Scott Peterson had a cut on his hand, which seemed fresh and recent. Scott was seen vacuuming and re-vacuuming the laundry room of his house on Christmas morning by Lacey's friends, Stacy and Lori. Law enforcement believed that Scott Peterson used the several days that he had before they conducted their search to clean up the crime scene. On January 5th, 6th, and 9th, Scott Peterson returned to the Berkeley Marina and watched law enforcement as their dive teams attempted to find the remains of Lacey Peterson. Peterson would go on to rent several different vehicles to revisit the marina, believed to be an attempt to hide his tracks while he monitored law enforcement's efforts to find Lacey. Days later, Scott would tell Detective Grogan, without being asked, that they may find Scott's blood in his truck because he cut himself all the time and bled on the door of his truck, statements that were entirely unprompted by anyone. Scott Peterson lied to several people on the day that Lacey went missing, saying that he was out golfing that day, something that was proven to be a lie. 
The shoes that Scott said Lacey wore on her walks were found in their home. Eventually, when Scott was confronted with a picture of him and Amber at the Christmas party by law enforcement, he looked at it and said, Is that supposed to be me? Peterson claimed to have only one debit card, when in fact he had two. The other PayPal debit card was shown to have been used to purchase various items and gifts for his mistresses. Scott referred to Lacey in the past tense in several of his conversations with law enforcement and eventually the media, including asking about cadaver dogs within the first 24 hours after Lacey's initial disappearance. After Scott's initial conversation with law enforcement, he would never call them again to inquire the status of their investigation into finding Lacey. During law enforcement's investigation, a cadaver dog hit on Scott's boat and the boat trailer, as well as back at the Peterson home, following the trail out to the middle of the street, which indicated that Lacey left inside of a vehicle. On the day of his arrest, Scott claims that he was running from the media, trying to avoid their incessant efforts to tail him. We now know that law enforcement was in fact tailing him that day, and while he was being pursued, Scott would get out of his vehicle and yell, Why don't you just arrest me already? Later that day, Scott would be arrested by law enforcement as he continued to drive erratically, which law enforcement believed was his attempts to shake their tail and flee the country. In his vehicle, law enforcement found the following. Survival gear, a tent, a shovel, a gun, a knife, Viagra, sleeping pills, various camping gear, over $10,000 in cash, including Mexican pesos, four cell phones, and his brother's ID. Police also believe that his family had made efforts to help Scott flee the country. After Scott's mother had given him $10,000 shortly after Lacey and Connor were found. But it wasn't until recently that it was revealed that Scott Peterson had also been found with a map of Amber Fry's workplace. Law enforcement believed at the time that Scott had planned to end the life of Amber Fry because she would pose a considerable problem for him if and when his case went to trial. During the trial of Scott Peterson, it was revealed that he had multiple affairs. During the five months that he dated Janet Ilsey, she walked in on him and Lacey in bed together. Janet would admit that she had no idea that Scott was already married and that he had indicated to her that he wanted to meet her family. And when he dated Amber, he lied to her saying that he had a degree in divinity, even buying a fake degree to fit his lie. And all of these interactions with each of these girlfriends occurred while Scott Peterson was married to his wife, Lacey Peterson. These details don't even come close to encapsulating all of the evidence testimony, cross-examination, and detailed accounts that happened over the course of a nearly six-month-long jury trial. But it does give a more complete view of the case against Scott Peterson. By the time attorney Mark Garagos was given the opportunity to tell his side of the story, his entire case was largely seen as incomplete and unproductive. His closing remarks were seen as so ineffectual that it made national news. And it wasn't simply due to the fact that he was having a bad day. Attorney Garagos was trying to polish a literal turd of a case, devoid of reasonable doubt, despite his client's efforts to obscure the evidence of his criminality. Even the most prepared, experienced, and knowledgeable legal minds would have been hard-pressed to effectuate a different outcome, and the jury would explain why. Members of the jury were later asked why they found Scott Peterson guilty of the homicide of Lacey and Connor Peterson, and to them, it was simple. Scott had been fishing in the same vicinity of where Lacey and Connor were later found. Upon arriving home, he immediately washed himself and his clothes before calling anyone, let alone his wife. Scott Peterson was the last person to see Lacey alive. And finally, Scott Peterson had the means motive, and opportunity to commit the crime in a way that no one else did. But now we have finally arrived at why I spent over a month working on this case, and my hope is that it will explain exactly why I took the time to get to this point. The High Price of Misinformation 
Over the last decade, there has been a massive shift in the way that criminal defendants have arbitrated their convictions. For most of the last century, if someone was wrongfully convicted of a crime, they would have to rely on the appellate process to petition a higher court to review the facts of their case and request a new trial. In extraordinary occasions, the appellate court may have their conviction vacated or set aside, effectively absolving them of their incarceration. But this is exceedingly rare in the criminal justice system. Successfully appealing a conviction has become increasingly more and more expensive, complicated, and often requires many years before any significant action is taken, if at all. And as a consequence of the slow-moving wheels of justice, we have begun to see a considerable effort by the convicted to try their cases in the court of public opinion. These new methods are seen as an incredibly powerful tool to bring attention to cases that have languished in the court system, cases that involve men and women who have endured wrongful convictions and that for a variety of reasons can only find justice by means of advocacy through social media, celebrity attention, or pardons from governors and or presidents. This is best demonstrated in the case of Adnan Syed. Regardless of where you land on the guilt or innocence of his case, a compelling argument can be made that it is because of the attention by the media and the serial podcast that ultimately led to him being a free man. We can all agree that people who are truly innocent, who have been unfairly convicted, deserve their freedom. However, over the last 10 years, as social media has become an integral part of society, the use of those platforms has been weaponized by criminal defendants to reframe their own stories. And the success of those efforts has started to gain the attention of those who were previously believed to be guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. And now, the supporters of those defendants utilize various forms of social media that helps to drastically change the narrative of their guilt previously held by the general public simply by dropping small and persistent seeds of doubt. Eventually, those seeds take root, and if they succeed in maturing and growing to fruition, their grassroots efforts may eventually convince someone with the means and connection to create one of the most effective tools that can change the minds of millions. A tool that has the power to change and alter the way that we see the world around us, permanently. On January 19th, 2013, a documentary premiered at the Sundance Film Festival that would eventually go on to be nominated for Best Documentary at the BAFTA Film Awards. It told the story of an orca named Tilikum and the profoundly negative impact that captivity has on their species. The documentary Blackfish was eventually released on Netflix and quickly became one of the most talked about documentaries of the year. It would go on to have such a profound effect on the public's view of SeaWorld that it would eventually lead to their closure of the killer whale shows and the breeding program entirely. The impact was so significant that it resulted in a drastic decrease in the overall profitability of the company and would lead to a class action lawsuit for failure to admit to shareholders that the documentary had profoundly affected attendance at the park. Entire segments of the general public had vowed to stop attending SeaWorld because of a single documentary the impact of which is still being discussed and felt to this very day. A documentary did that. For much of the last 20 years, we have watched the rise of the Innocence Project and other similar organizations come to the forefront of the criminal justice system. Their efforts have exposed wrongful convictions, have helped men and women fight their innocence, and through the use of advanced forensics like touch DNA, have helped to take the truly innocent off of death row and return to the wrongfully convicted their freedom. A generation of people that saw conviction rates soaring through the 70s, 80s, and 90s have begun to question the validity of a justice system that failed to exonerate clear examples of the innocent being convicted for crimes they did not commit. It is incredibly important that we continue to advocate for the innocent, 
But I believe that in this case specifically, the pendulum has swung too far in the other direction. In just the last decade, we have watched the likes of Jodi Arias, convicted of the brutal homicide of her former boyfriend, Travis Alexander, gain considerable support hosting her own website, boasting a net worth of over $1 million, and selling her art that she makes in prison for tens of thousands of dollars, doing all of this while serving a life sentence for a truly vicious crime. Arius lives a more comfortable life than a vast majority of middle-class Americans trying to make ends meet, and largely because of the notoriety that she has received from the crime that she committed. And now she enjoys the support of thousands who regularly advocate for her innocence on her behalf, all over social media and right here on YouTube. Just two months ago, we watched Casey Anthony bring her case before the general public through her own docuseries, which sought to disregard all of the evidence and claim that the former most hated mother in America was actually the victim, not the perpetrator. A story that was told for her by NBC through a three-part documentary series. And now, even a cursory look into the social media platform TikTok will show you the overwhelming support Anthony now enjoys because of the effectiveness of her campaign to rewrite history. Even the infamous familicidal convict Chris Watts has an ever-growing community of supporters who now create content on this very platform that seeks to question the legitimacy of his conviction. Despite the evidence and his own confession, his own parents now claim that he could not have been responsible for his crimes, and they seek to put the blame and culpability of his conviction on a conspiracy to hide the truth. And here's the thing. Every single one of the people that I just mentioned, people that I have already discussed on this platform, they are succeeding. Each and every day, they find new supporters, people who are not familiar with the totality of their cases or who just don't care and who only see what they want to. That the person who was charged, tried, and convicted is one of the many who are unfairly treated by the justice system, by the media, and because of that, they don't deserve to be behind bars. And now, after reviewing this case in its entirety, I believe that one of the most successful campaigns of misinformation that has occurred in recent history began the day that his beautiful wife went missing. Since December 24th, 2002, I believe that Scott Peterson, his family, and many of his supporters have intentionally misled the public to create a narrative that does not line up with the facts. I believe that they have succeeded in deceiving countless people into believing that Scott Peterson is innocent and that he was one of the many wrongfully convicted victims of a justice system overrun by a media-frenzied populace storming the gates, pitchforks in hand. It takes our predilection for empathizing with the innocent and it gaslights us into believing a narrative that requires you to keep your head in the sand. And in a time where we still have people who genuinely and sincerely believe that the earth is flat, I am no longer surprised when I hear people refusing to see undeniable truth staring them right in the face. For me, it is cognitive dissonance at its worst. Because there is a vast difference between believing that Scott Peterson is innocent and actively telling the world that he is. We can all believe whatever we want to, but perpetuating a viewpoint that robs victims of justice is something else entirely. During my investigation, I came across someone who asked me the question, why does it matter if Scott Peterson is trying to lie his way out of prison? Who does that narrative harm? I believe that his lies harm everyone. It tarnishes the memory of Lacey her family, and now the myriads of people who have been enticed by the claim that he had nothing to do with her death. It continues to defame and ignore the life that was stolen from Lacey before she ever had the chance to be a mother, something that she had wanted since she was a little girl. And what's worse is the person who was convicted for that crime continues to categorically refuse to acknowledge, accept, or agree that he shares any blame 
whatsoever. And now he has successfully convinced untold number of people that deny Lacey and her family the justice they deserve. I have a request. Just for a moment, clear your mind and really try to imagine what it would be like to be the parents or family of Lacey Peterson. After spending a lifetime watching their daughter flourish as a child, as a young woman, and then as a future mother, they had all of that taken away from them. Every single year at Christmas time, when the rest of the world is enjoying the holidays, spending time with family and loved ones, they have to relive and be reminded of one of the most public and horrendous tragedies that we've seen in the last 20 years. The roaches don't get to heal because the people who now viciously defend Scott's innocence refuse to allow them to have any peace or solace. You cannot imagine the things I've seen all over the internet from people who defend Scott Peterson outright waging war against anyone who dares to challenge their claims of his innocence. These aren't just a few fringe people. Their entire narrative has been shown on some of the largest media conglomerates and networks in the world. The a e series alone has over three and a half million views on YouTube. I cannot fathom what the parents of Lacey Peterson have been through, suffering the loss of their child, being under the scrutiny of the media, always under the watchful eye of the general public, enduring years of waiting for justice, laboring through a nearly six-month-long jury trial, having to see pictures of Lacey and Connor desecrated, and then suffering a near mistrial during the jury deliberations, only to finally hear the words, We the jury find Scott Peterson guilty. And that's where this story should have ended. But it didn't. Scott continued to lie, something he's been doing for decades, and then chose to weaponize his refusal to be a man and empowered his defenders to go wage war with the truth. I don't like the word victim because it implies that the person is helpless and unable to fend for themselves. But in this case, I believe that Scott Peterson has made victims of the family of Lacey Peterson and everyone else that he has convinced that he is actually innocent. And when lies become the truth, it prevents those who are truly innocent from being given the opportunity to have their case heard. People who genuinely need the assistance of organizations like the Innocence Project are relegated to the back burner because the stories of people like Scott Peterson, who enjoy the considerable financial support of his wealthy family, are able to encourage and support a six-part documentary series that floods the airwaves with misinformation. A documentary that is, in my opinion, one of the most overt examples of misinformation that I have seen in the last 10 years. There are truly innocent people whose stories you have never heard. And do you know why? Because those people don't have a wealthy family. They can't afford a million-dollar retainer for a lawyer like Mark Garagos. And they don't have brothers and sisters with a vested interest in getting their brother out of prison because of the impact that it has on each of them. I spent many years of my career being on the side of defending my clients, even clients that made terrible mistakes. But no matter what they did or didn't do, the line was always drawn when or if the only way forward was to craft a web of lies to free them from a conviction or losing the outcome of a case. Because the truth, it matters. And not because I say so, but because it's the right thing for Lacey and for their family that was robbed of knowing Connor, of being grandparents, of the memories, the holidays, and all of the moments they would have had watching Lacey become a mom. At the beginning of this video, I told you that I have a new opinion of this case, and it's true, I do. Reviewing this case has changed the way that I see true crime cases forever, because I will no longer accept claims made by documentaries created by either side without evidence to back or support them. I will not allow media pundits to dictate how I feel about anything, most especially a criminal proceeding. Previous to my investigation of this case, 
I believe that it was entirely possible that Scott Peterson was in fact innocent of the crimes that he was convicted of in his jury trial, that maybe there was more to his story, and that we had all been wrong. But now, after everything that I've presented to you, and I assure you it is nowhere close to the totality of the evidence that exists that points to his guilt, but after all of the hours spent reading documents, evidence, testimony, pleadings, rulings, audio recordings, books, and everything in between, I have come to this definitive conclusion. I believe that Scott Peterson has engaged in a decades-long effort to reframe the truth through a deliberate campaign of misinformation and lies. That he is a boy who never learned the importance of integrity, of being a man and accepting responsibility for his misdeeds, but that Scott Peterson is definitively guilty of the crime of the homicide of Lacey and Connor Peterson. Because the truth matters, even if Scott Peterson refuses to acknowledge it. In closing today, I want to take the time to remember the incredible life of Lacey Peterson. Her mother, Sharon Rocha, wrote an incredible book called For Lacey. In the book, she describes Lacey's childhood her teen years, and what she was like as a young adult. She goes into detail, outlining the experiences, her memories, and moments that they shared as a mother and as a daughter. And I want to take a moment to read a passage from her book, because while so much of this video has been about Scott, I want to end it with the person who matters most, Lacey and the son that she couldn't wait to have. This is an excerpt from the book, for Lacey. I can't accept what happened to Lacey. I just can't. There's nothing as devastating as the death of a child. And there's nothing as unacceptable as what Scott did to her. Together, the two are an unimaginable horror. December 24th, 2002 is the day the sky crashed down on our lives. Time stopped. Lacey's been gone almost three years as I write this sentence, and wounds have yet to heal. I measure life from that call from Scott. Things either happen before or after it. Life has gone on, but in increments of pain, anger, and grief. From what I know, that's how it is for families of this kind of tragedy. It's certainly that way for me. The trial seems surreal, almost like it didn't happen. I'm glad Scott received the punishment he deserved, but I can't say that I derived any satisfaction from it. There definitely hasn't been any closure. Other than the steel doors clinking shut every night, what's closed? The hole in my heart hasn't closed. Lacey is still gone. What happened is just sad. Lacey at 27 years old, seven and a half months pregnant, exuberant, generous, full of life, and excited about the future had her life stolen. And the person responsible was the man she trusted more than anyone. Our lives shouldn't be like this at all. Not Lacey's, not Scott's, not ours or the Petersons. I'm heartsick for all of us. I still want to know what possessed him to do it. I want to know what he did. I want to know what happened to Lacey. I want to know what made him think he could get away with it. So many questions unanswered. At the end of her book, Sharon Rocha goes on to describe a dream that she had several years after Lacey and Connor were found. As a parent, I read this next part of her book and my heart absolutely broke for her and for Lacey's family. But these are the final words of her book, For Lacey. And then there was this one brief, wonderful, peaceful moment when she came back. It was mid-June 2005, and I was asleep dreaming about Lacey, something I've rarely done. As the dream happened, I was also able to watch it from afar, two distinct vantage points allowing me to remember the details with unusual clarity. In the dream, the day was bright, warm, and sunny, and I felt the way I did before Lacey was stolen from us. 
I was happy, content, and hopeful, like maybe something good was going to happen. Then I saw my dad, who was buried in the same cemetery as Lacey, lead my daughter, whole and beautiful, out from her grave. My father knew how much I needed to see her. Holding her hand, he brought her home to me. Then he disappeared, leaving the two of us alone. Lacey and I were in the backyard where we sat beneath the fruitless plum tree. I sat cross-legged and she laid on her right side with her cheek on my thigh. She was wearing the same bathrobe that she had worn as a little girl. I took my fingers and brushed her bangs to the side, stroked her cheek and marveled that she always had the softest complexion. Lacey said something to me and her voice was raspy for not speaking for two years. It felt wonderful to have her back. I was able to touch her again. She looked up at me and smiled, the same way she did as a little girl, the same way she did as a teenager, the same way she did the last time we were together and I put my hand on her pregnant belly. I was at peace. All was calm. As she talked, Lacey extended her left arm in the air, waving it around for emphasis. She always gestured as she talked. I used to say she talked with her hands just as I did. We were alike in so many ways, close in so many ways. I stared at her beautiful little hands, adoring her long slender fingers and soft skin. And then I saw her fingernails were polished. Is that Dutch tulips? I asked, remembering the name of the color both of us liked. Yes, she said with a giggle. Then she said something else. Mom, why did Scott want to kill me? She asked. I don't know, honey, I said. I didn't want to die, she said. Why did this happen? I don't know, honey, I repeated. Mom, I came to tell you that I'm okay, she said. I wanted you to know that we're at peace and I love you. The last thing I remember is saying, I love you too. And I did. And I do. And I always will. Several weeks ago, a fellow content creator here on YouTube named Matt Orchard also covered the Scott Peterson case. Instead of viewing his content as competition, I wanted to do something very different. After watching his video in its entirety, I decided that this video would complement his. I have always believed that content creation is an art, and when it's done well, it deserves the praise and attention from the community, regardless of the ever-changing winds of the algorithm. Matt Orchard's video is truly exceptional, and I highly recommend that you watch it. Any area of Scott's case that he discussed, I have tried to leave to him, so my video is intended to be complimentary to his. Many of you may already be aware that the last month has been particularly challenging for me. I underwent a complicated oral surgery procedure, and I am still in the process of having reconstructive surgery that will take the better part of 18 months to complete. So I want to thank you for your support while I've been on the mend. Your kind words and remembering me has meant the world to me. I am so grateful to be a part of this community and for each of you. Thank you all for reminding me that this world is full of beautiful people and that this life is truly a gift. Now, I have mentioned it several times throughout this video, but this episode has been the combined effort of nearly a dozen people over the last five to six weeks. And I want to take a moment to thank them for their help with the incredible volume of research that went into understanding this case. Sherry is our lead researcher and she helps keep the BCM research team together. It is because of her that I am able to condense thousands of hours of research into each video. So thank you to Sherry and each of the BCM research team members. You are all appreciated immeasurably. And to the YouTube and Patreon subscribers as well, believing in me while I took the time to make this episode is nothing short of incredible. And I am so 
truly overwhelmed by your vote of confidence. I am only able to do this work because each of you have made it possible. I also want to say that my goal for creating content will continue to be focused on quality above all else. That may mean that videos take extra time, but I believe that the additional effort is worthwhile, and my hope is that the videos that I produce will be worth the wait. It was just three years ago that I had undergone my last major spine surgery, and I was terrified. I couldn't see a way forward, and money had become a problem faster than I had been anticipating. After a pandemic and countless struggles in between, I couldn't have imagined that I would find my way here. Some people spend the entirety of their lives trying to achieve their wildest dreams, and I am so thankful to say that I can count myself lucky to be amongst those who are living their dreams each and every day. And I can only say that because you have made that possible. I am already feverishly working on the next series, and it will be very much like this one. But if you made it this far and enjoyed this series, then the next series will be right up your alley. And as always, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Those things go a long way to continue to help support this channel. And thank you for your time, for your support, and for being here with me today. This has been Behind Criminal Minds. We'll see you next time.